Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. In today's video, we'll be discussing the style of Hollywood icon Fred Astaire, his approach to dressing, and what lessons you can adopt and adapt into your own wardrobe. <laughs> Perhaps no other figure in the history of American cinema did as much to define the spirit of the musical as did Fred Astaire. He's remembered primarily as a dancer, and rightly so, as his supremely tasteful blend of tap and ballroom styles with a dash of ballet meant that he is often seen as America's most consummate film dancer. His only real rival for that title is a contemporary of his, Gene Kelly. However, he was also a distinctive singer, and he introduced many of the songs now part of the pantheon known collectively as the Great American Songbook, and his acting style showcased a blend of optimistic insouciance that was really the ideal of American cinema at the time. But in addition to all this, and our primary focus here at the Gentleman's Gazette, is his impeccable style. Before we get started breaking down his sartorial wisdom, though, here's a brief biography. He was born Frederick Emanuel Austerlitz on May 10, 1899 in Omaha, Nebraska. When Fred's older sister Adele began to show a natural talent for dancing, both of the children began pursuing the arts. And although Fred refused to take dance lessons at first, he was easily able to mimic his sister's movements, showing his natural talent. Also, he took up piano, accordion, and clarinet, showing that he was equally adept as a musician. The family moved to New York in 1905, and both of the children would start receiving formal training at this point. Also around this time, the family name was changed from Austerlitz to the more elegant Astaire. By the age of 14, Fred had taken on the musical responsibilities for his and Adele's act, and at the age of 16, he first met composer George Gershwin, launching a friendship and collaboration that would profoundly impact American popular culture. The Astaires first hit Broadway in 1917, and they would continue to perform on Broadway and on London stages throughout the 1920s. Even at this point, Fred's tap dancing was recognized as being among the best. In 1930, Robert Benchley wrote, I don't think that I will plunge the nation into war by stating that Fred is the greatest tap dancer in the world. When his sister Adele married Lord Charles Cavendish in 1932, Fred continued on the stage as a solo act and then hit Hollywood in 1933. And despite a poor screen test at RKO Radio Pictures, which according to Fred read, can't act, slightly bald, also dances, producer David O. Selznick took a chance on him, saying, I am uncertain about the man, but I feel, in spite of his enormous ears and bad chin line, that his charm is so tremendous that it comes through even in this wretched test. Fred made his film debut in the musical Dancing Lady, starring opposite Joan Crawford, and was then paired with Ginger Rogers for a sequence in the film Flying Down to Rio. Astaire and Rogers would make nine films together at RKO, including Top Hat, Follow the Fleet, Swing Time, and Shall We Dance. Six out of these nine RKO musicals became the biggest moneymakers for the studio, and they propelled Fred and Ginger to superstardom leaving RKO in 1939 to freelance in film, which was relatively rare at the time, Astaire would go on to partner with other dancers such as Eleanor Powell and Rita Hayworth, and he also made two memorable films with Bing Crosby. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, Astaire would go on to headline a few other musical films, as well as produce a number of television specials. His final musical film was 1968's Finian's Rainbow, and he had a few few more dramatic roles in the 1970s. 1981's Ghost Story was Astaire's final film. He died of pneumonia on June 22, 1987, at the age of 88. Even after his death, his legacy as a singer and a dancer lives on. Astaire is credited with two innovations in the history of early film musicals. The first was leaving the camera largely stationary and taking long, unbroken shots to show the full scope of a dance routine. 
The second was harnessing a film's musical numbers to actually serve the plot rather than just being diversions. And although he possessed a somewhat light voice, Astaire was admired as a singer by such great American composers as Irving Berlin, George Gershwin, and Cole Porter. More popular songs in the so-called Great American Songbook were introduced on film by Astaire than any other popular singer of the time, including Bing Crosby or Frank Sinatra. So, now that you know the man a little bit better, let's go over his distinct style, starting with a general overview. One need look no further than the various characters Astaire played on film at the time to get an overall sense of his style. These characters notably broke with the standards of the time for what an ideal male leading character was to be. Rather than being wealthy, titled, or overly formal, Astaire's characters, and indeed he himself, embodied the idealized American man. Self-made, ambitious, self-taught, and tenacious. And as menswear historian G. Bruce Boyer writes in his book Fred Astaire Style, Astaire mixed his dance styles the way he mixed his dress styles, with a spontaneous exuberance in which the hard work was well hidden within the detail and subtlety. His blend of urban English shape with casual American style typifies American dress to this day. His characters showed a fresh approach to the romantic hero. Vitality, urbanity, charm, and natural talent all carried off in an effortless manner. Astaire was the democratic ideal, a classless aristocrat. Essentially, Astaire's sartorial genius came from his ability to look simultaneously formal and casual, neat and yet pleasingly rumpled. He was intimately well acquainted with the traditional rules of menswear, so he knew how to bend or break them in order to fit his own tastes. He could wear suits in conservative shades without looking drab, more colorful combinations without looking gaudy, and of course, a tuxedo or a full dress ensemble without looking the least bit uncomfortable. So how then did he accomplish this? In order to answer that question, here's a more complete breakdown of Astaire's particular style choices. Paraphrasing again from Bruce Boyer, one of the key aspects of Astaire's wardrobe was a focus on softness and comfort. Jackets had to be roomy enough not to be constricting, but to still hold their shape. Trousers had to be cut on the full side, but not sloppy or billowy. From Astaire, a new aesthetic evolved, and so did the relationship between clothes and attitude, style and demeanor. During the Depression, this aesthetic became the Mid-Atlantic model, a blend of Savile Row with Princeton. In other words, Astaire was able to seamlessly combine the hallmarks of traditional English tailoring with a more contemporary American prep style. By the way, we've done videos on prep style, which you can find here, and the differences between English, American, and Italian suit fashions, which you can find here. And Astaire had ample exposure to both of these style traditions, as he had been a Brooks Brothers customer since his teens, and his travels while on stage in London had introduced him to Savile Row. To follow this dual emphasis on form and function, Astaire chose supple weights of fabric to enhance the drape of his suits, and in particular he always made sure that his armholes were cut particularly high to maximize his movement, especially when dancing. This was particularly true of his full dress ensembles, which were often made by Anderson and Shepard. While many men assume that white tie must be inherently uncomfortable to wear with its high starched collar and exacting cuts, Astaire definitely proved this assumption to be false. And fortunately, we don't need to speculate on Astaire's opinions about specific different kinds of garments, because he gave these opinions to interviewer Richard Hubler in a 1957 piece for Gentleman's Quarterly. For example, in terms of suits, he typically preferred traditional staple hues like navy blue and charcoal grays and browns. The only light color I like, he said, is light gray. Meanwhile, his choices for combinations of a blazer or sport coat with odd trousers could often be a bit more bold and incorporate more patterns. 
In either case, he did prefer that his jackets usually have deep side vents, often up to 7 inches or so, in accordance with traditional British styling. His trousers were usually both pleated and cuffed, although he did wear them shorter than many men of the time, with little or no break. He said, I don't want them slopping over onto my shoes. Another reason for a shorter trouser break was to draw more attention to his feet while dancing in films. He also accomplished this by wearing socks and sometimes shoes in contrasting colors to the trousers. And while he did prefer a shorter hem, Astaire also preferred for his trousers to have a higher waistline. This made his legs look longer and more athletic, and made him appear taller overall, even though he was only about 5'9". Of course, shoes were the workhorses of Astaire's wardrobe. He was often said to go through dozens of pairs while rehearsing for a show or a film, and in terms of his own private collection, he often preferred two-tone spectator shoes, or Oxfords in either white buckskin or brown suede. In terms of shirts, Astaire purchased just as many off-the-rack as he had custom-made. In his time, the style was for shirts to fit more generously in the chest and sleeves than they do today, so a slightly looser fit that one would typically get off-the-rack wouldn't be seen as sloppy. Still, his shirts did fit him well for his size. He would occasionally wear patterned shirts, something like stripes, but he was most partial to solids in pastel colors like blue, yellow, and a personal favorite of his, pink. Solid pastel shirts, by the way, are a maximally versatile option for pairing with all different manner of ties and jackets, as well as accessories. You can find our videos on pairing shirts and ties with gray suits and with blue suits here. Overall, he preferred button-cuffed shirts to ones with French cuffs, and would typically wear cufflinks only with formal dress, wherein they, as well as the shirt studs, would often contain precious gems. He disliked tab collars, often preferring button-down collars or spread collars strengthened with collar stays. When he did choose to wear a traditional point collar, he would often accentuate it by wearing a collar pin, clip, or bar. And in terms of ties, he preferred tying a Windsor knot, and often opted for fuller, wider ties. He explained in that 1957 interview that he avoided narrower ties because, quote, I'm narrow enough myself, too narrow. While he was a bow tie wearer in his younger years, Astaire later settled into wearing primarily long neckties, and then in his later years, wearing neckerchiefs and ascots. Another use of neckwear for Astaire was one that would become a personal hallmark for him, using old ties or handkerchiefs as belts. This came from his dancing days, when his weight would fluctuate so rapidly that belts would be impractical at keeping up his trousers. Also a fan of colorful pocket squares, Astaire would usually wear them in more casual folds rather than something highly structured. Other than collar pins, tie bars, and occasionally a ring, Astaire did also like to accessorize with boutonnieres, particularly carnations. In hats, he liked models with low crowns and fairly narrow brims, usually of about 2 and 1 8 inches. According to him, an eighth of an inch can make a lot of difference in a brim. And while he obviously wore top hats with his full dress and morning dress ensembles, his everyday choices were felt fedoras and straw boaters, often accented with colorful grosgrain hat bands. So, with all of this said, how can one effectively emulate Fred Astaire's style? The easiest way to do it, of course, would just be to directly follow all of the points we've laid out here. Equally important to the garments themselves, however, is the attitude with which they're worn. As we've already said, while Astaire didn't shy away from incorporating colors or patterns into his shirts or accessories, he was able to assemble outfits with what can honestly be called an artist's eye. His combinations were always harmonious, and while they could be playful or even bright, they were never ostentatious or over the top. While he was always smartly attired, Astaire took pleasure in his wardrobe and fundamentally dressed for himself. 
As he was quoted in the aforementioned 1957 interview, I know that once in a while I've been on lists of best-dressed men, but it always comes as a surprise to me. I never think of myself as spick and span or all duded out, just as someone who wants to be comfortable and satisfy his own taste. As for wearing white tie like a stare, remember that the fit must be immaculate, ensuring ease of movement. Even if you don't plan to dance like he did, and really, who can? Even so, as he admitted in his autobiography, Steps in Time, at the risk of disillusionment, I must admit that I don't like top hats, white ties, and tails. By the way, whether you consider yourself a bigger fan of white tie than Fred Astaire or not, you can find a comprehensive guide to it in our black tie guide on the website here. And if you're looking for print resources to study up on Astaire's style, we would again recommend G. Bruce Boyer's book, Fred Astaire Style, as well as Astaire's own autobiography. In conclusion, then, Fred Astaire created a unique blend of functionality and flair, and due to his classic first, quirky second leaning, his style has truly stood the test of time. Again quoting from Boyer, he could wear the uniform of the upper class when the need called for it, but it's ironic that the man some associated with the top hat and tails is really the one who popularized the sports jacket and soft lounge suit. Astaire wore white ties and tails as though they were pajamas, and a tuxedo as though it were part of his everyday routine. It wasn't supposed to look perfect, it was supposed to look natural. It worked then, and it works now. It's what genius and style are all about. In today's video, I'm obviously trying to incorporate a good number of Astaire's own style hallmarks. In fact, some of the elements of my outfit are directly inspired by what Astaire was wearing during that 1957 GQ interview. It was written to be as follows. A light pink shirt with tan cotton slacks and dark brown suede shoes. Speaking of the shoes, we'll actually start there, as I designed them myself from undandy to directly mimic a style that Astaire wore in the opening scenes of his 1957 film, Silk Stockings. They're dark brown suede oxfords, and they feature laces as well as contrast stitching in a lighter, more camel color. Also in camel, of course, is the sport coat I'm wearing today, which is a vintage model, as you can tell by some of the slight wear that's on the buttons. I'm wearing a pastel pink solid shirt today, as was one of Astaire's favorites, and it's accentuated by one of our Fort Belvedere ties in a Prince of Wales check pattern. The pocket square is also from Fort Belvedere. It's a wool silk blend featuring a rabbit motif for a pattern. The other Fort Belvedere accessories in my outfit today are my gold-colored collar clip, as well as my pink carnation boutonniere. While Astaire didn't often wear cufflinks in day-to-day -day life, most of my shirts take them, so today I've worn gold cufflinks, vintage models, to harmonize well with the collar clip. My trousers are in a medium brown shade, and they're being held up today by an old pink tie that we had in the studio. I'm here using, of course, one of Astaire's style trademarks. And finally, my socks are pastel pink to directly harmonize with my shirt, though I'm not necessarily sure I'll need to be drawing any attention to my ankles, as I won't be doing any dancing. <laughs> 